Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you remember the great big chess scandal that happened in September, October 2022 between Magnus Carlsen and Hans Niemann? Probably a lot of you. Uh, some of you got into chess in January of 2023. There was this recent surge, so you might not know what I'm talking about, but uh, after you watch this video, you can familiarize yourself uh, with that massive scandal. And actually, a massive component of that scandal is still pending, which is the lawsuit. There's a great big lawsuit out there uh, filed by Hans Niemann uh, against Magnus Carlsen and others, and Hans has sort of laid low since then. He can't really get on a microphone and say his, anything he wants because things, there's a legal component to all this. But you know what Hans Niemann can do? He can play chess. And he's been playing chess as recently as a couple of days ago in Menorca, in Spain. He played in the Menorca Open, and in this video, I'm going to show you three really amazing games of chess that he played. And he tied for first! He tied for first place in this tournament uh, and posted a very strong performance of 2700 and is top 30 in the world in chess. Hans Lehmann is the 30th ranked chess player in the world. And he's like 19. All right, maybe he's turning 20. Um, he played really, really well. And we're still waiting to see what happens with the lawsuit. And if, none, if all those words are meaningless because you're... So new and fresh to the chess world, familiar, familiarize yourself uh, with that story. I'm going to show you three games that he played. Uh, the first one is against uh, Grandmaster Yuri Solodovny... <clears throat> Yuri Solodovnychenko uh, from uh, Ukraine. Uh, Hans played a Sicilian defense. He was busting out the Sicilian quite a bit in this tournament. Knight f3, knight c6. And it was a classical Sicilian with the move d6. Of course, here, black can choose... Uh, to play the Sveshnikov, but this is one of the most reliable openings. And now bishop g5 is known as the Richter Rauser variation, uh, an extremely, extremely aggressive way for white to play. Queen d2 long castles is on the cards. Black oftentimes plays like a slingshot. The bishops stand behind the pawns, very passive, but also very massive. And uh, Hans plays bishop d7. He doesn't play e6. So he doesn't make sure that he can take back with the queen. He actually doesn't mind getting his pawn structure damaged like this. Now, a move here that would be very bad is e takes f6 because that would leave white with a monster outpost on the d5 square, an outpost being a square on the opponent's side of the board frequently that cannot be fought for uh, and where you can plant a piece and exert a lot of pressure. Uh, and uh, also this would be a terrible weakness. So Hans plays g takes f6 and then he plays this move h5. Now, I don't understand something about chess. Like, I, I, I watch these top players play, and I'm like, what? H5? All right, bishop d7, knight c6. I mean, if I had a student playing like this, I would yell at them. But, you know, I'm watching these grandmasters play. I'm like, all right, well, they must know what they're talking about. Uh, black wants to instigate over here, potentially. Uh, black also uh, would, in some point in the future, like to play bishop h6. Like, that would be really nice. Um, and also, white has to make a move, so white plays bishop b5. Uh, Hans plays queen c7, and queen c7 is a very funny move because you can be attacked and queen a5 doesn't actually win anything because you can't take this. That would be very tragic. Uh, so the players actually repeat moves here. Essentially, white is like, yeah, I'm fine drawing you. I got no, I got no beef. Let's make a draw, dude. Hans is like, I'm 230 po 220 points higher rated, so I, I got to play uh, a6, and we're going to have bishops versus knights. So, white has an advantage here. Why does white have an advantage? White has a much better pawn structure. Doesn't have doubled pawns, no, no lone or h pawn. Black is also kind of stuck in development. Like, if black wants to play uh, for development, he's gonna have to play e6, which will weaken his pawns to kick out this knight. Uh, white has queen d3 and just sort of very natural piece play. The bishop has to go back to d7. You see Hans kind of going back and forth and back and forth. White making good progress. Queen to c7. Now... What white should do here is probably long castle, but he plays f5, which is probably fine. And we have the following position. And still, when you look at it visually, I mean, I love white's position. I love it. I love white's position. Why do I love it so much? Because he's going to go here. He's going to put pressure on the f file. If this pawn ever goes to e5, uh, black is just positionally dead lost after knight d5, just completely dead lost. So, um, again, like it, 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 it takes somebody with a very decent nervous system to play chess in this position with black. Hans plays king b8, always a good move. Sidestep off the c file, could potentially attack here, could potentially play b5 if he wants. Rook f1, bishop b7, and this is a typical classical Sicilian. Black is just rock solid with those bishops defending all the pawns. 
But I gotta tell you, visually, I mean, this just, if you could hit the pause button right here, the chess gods would just give the win to white. But you still gotta play chess. And white plays rook f3. Multi-purpose move, potentially going this way and potentially going that way, which could prove to be more fatal because, of course, the monarch is over there. Uh, black plays bishop c8, and that simultaneously defends the position, could potentially prepare the move d5. And here, white plays rook g3, clearly going down to g7, right? That's, that's sort of the plan. Uh, now, if Hans succeeds in playing d5, he's going to win the game. What does that mean? Well, Hans has two bishops, right? So the bishops really like open space. And white has what, we, what I've been describing as kind of like an advantage, a positional advantage. He has a lot of benefits. He has more activity, more space, slightly better future peace prospects because of the nature of the close position. The way you deal with a person that has a positional advantage against you um, is you punch them straight in the face. And that generally in chess can even things out. Now, you may or may not be accused of battery and uh, get in some severe trouble, so I'm not condoning that. But another way, uh, when you don't want to resort to physical violence uh, to deal with somebody that has a positional advantage against you, is you play dynamically. So you play in a way that muddies the waters, and as you're gonna see here, Han starts attacking him with that H-pawn, which I told you a long time ago could be useful, uh, and, and, then, and then Hans here plays the move D5. Uh, and it just took a matter of moves, but let me tell you, everything's about to open up. The bishops are going to come alive. The queen, hello? This is one thing you got to get better at as a chess player, realizing that when one piece moves, it affects the whole board. Literally, one pawn push opens the bishop, the queen, and the rook. And by weakening that, it's going to open up this side as well. And white's position here, this is the first domino to fall. Now, here's something really weird happens. And I don't think the game proceeded like this. I think the board malfunctioned. Now, Hans went on to win this game. And clearly, as you can see here, he did it in a sophisticated way by opening up the position against his opponent's advantages. But, yeah, the, the, the relay now says rook to d1. And then Hans takes here, losing all his advantage. Then it says that white hangs a rook? This is just free. Rook h5 is played, however. So then white hangs the knight, which doesn't get taken, and then hangs his queen, and then goes here, and then this is free again. Knight f5 back, that's free. Rook h3 hangs a rook. Knight g3 hangs a knight. Rook e4 hangs a rook three different ways. And the game ends. Now listen, I don't mean, it, I don't mean to be a hater, but I don't think any of that happened. Um, I don't think the players just played like a very sophisticated game and all of a sudden, you know, played like they were on a really, really, really bad trip. Um, but yeah, uh, Hans won this game. I just wanted to show this because it had a hilarious, you know, malfunction at the end. But, but Hans won, and it was, it was a nice game. It was a nice little game. Um, but the next, the next two games had no board errors, and, and, and they, really, they really were special. Uh, they, they, the, these two games were sensational. Uh, Hans's next opponent after uh, Yuri was uh, Bahab Sanal, who's a strong uh, Turkish Grandmaster. And this game is, has a special place in the chess world's heart this game in particular, because it has the exact same 10 moves as the very famous Chess Speaks for Itself game where Hans beat Magnus in Miami in the FTX Crypto Cup. Uh, and it started with a Rosalimo Sicilian with bishop to b5. And then white just t delayed the capture on c6 for a very long time. And black is playing in a very provocative way, allowing white to move the pawn into the center of the board, attacking the knight on f6, kind of hitting it around. And now knight to c3 and dropping back like this, Knight e4 attacks the pawn on c5, Hans defends it, but with his king still in the center of the board, white plays knight to f6 check, which looks like a fatal knockout punch, because if pawn takes, pawn takes, boom and boom, and like you're gonna take and black is lost. But knight f6 is just met with king f8, and black is like, I don't need to castle, stupid, you can, now you gotta go back, right? This is the exact same thing that happened, this, they're, they're following exactly the same game, as Magnus Carlsen versus Hans Niemann, which is really funny. Excuse me, which is really, really funny. Because uh, that was the game that Hans beat Magnus, and 
then proceeded to walk out and say, you know, chess speaks for itself, and, uh, and, and, and then walked away. Uh, so this is very bold uh, by, uh, by the Turkish Grandmaster to play into this exact same thing. Hans pins his knight, and Vahat plays knight c3. Clearly out of prep, right? Like, look at the time spent, right? 11 minutes, uh, and, and, and Hans plays knight e6, and Hans just doesn't need to castle. He doesn't need to castle because he's Hans Niemann and he does whatever the, you know, he wants. But also, white can't really do anything because white is pinned. And if white tries to kick out the bishop, black will just take and you're still kind of like stuck. I mean, you can't really do anything. And if, I mean, you try to, it's not really accomplishing anything. So, uh, knight b5. So attacking the queen, you cannot take because you're pinned. So you just move your queen. And white comes to a3 with the intention of playing knight c4. Queen d5 offering a trade and offering to improve the pawn structure, after which black is just calmly better. Uh, and actually, that does happen. We have a little bit of a dance here of pawns. And now the queens get traded. But Hans is just better. Why is he better? Good center presence, restricting white's movement, potential to attack with the h-pawn, and a target in the center of the board. All he had to do was just not castle. He then regroups on e6, gets this, he still has the pressure, still controls the center, and now even has an open file, and still can play h4, h3, and he can bring his rook! Nobody cares about black's king, because the more pieces that you trade, the less role the king plays in the game. c4, Hans now plays d4, locking the center of the board completely, and he has what we call a protected pass pawn. A pawn that cannot be stopped by any other pawns. It can only be blockaded. All right? Rook e4, rook to d8 centralizing, and now a red carpet has been laid, so bishop d2. That bishop is going to serve as a blockading piece of the pawn, so what does Hans do? Immediately trades the bishop immediately offers a bishop trade. White plays f4, preventing that. However, by playing the move f4, you have now pinned yourself. Try not to pin yourself in chess, because you can't move, and that pawn is a target. So not only can you not move, you also have to defend yourself. And if you go g3, I'm gonna go here or here. So, knight to g7 is an expert maneuver, back and forward, full blockade now of white structure, and rook g8, and every single piece that Hans Niemann has is being activated. Rook takes h5 is not possible because of the absolutely brutal fork on the rooks. So rook to h3 preventing that. Rook to b8 firing, firing away on the b-file. Black's rooks are standing on open lines and they are powerful. Rook to b6. Rook a6 is on the way. And you can go here. Unbelievable. A just spectacular piece coordination from Hans. White plays e6 trying to throw a wrench in the wheels. And Hans says... Okay, now I have all the perks of the position and an extra pawn. You have to play knight c2, rook to a6. I am attacking your weakness. I'm going to induce you to play the move a4 and now weaken the b3 pawn. Pawn to h4, anchoring in on the g3 square. a5, the bishop drops back. Rook to c6, b4, white tries to break out. It ain't good enough. King to f7. And white just has absolutely nothing brewing. He tries to create a little counterplay, but here comes the other rook. The knight plants itself on g3, and white can play rook e1, but it's just a matter of time before you resign. So he sacrifices his rook, but this is not a rook sacrifice that I need to yell for. This is a rook sacrifice where black comes back, gobbles everything, and uh, the rooks are now going to come and infiltrate. What a game from Hans. Th this was just ac actually from start to finish, just an absolutely clinical game against the 2600 Grandmaster. And Vahap Sanal played into the exact same position Hans had against Magnus. Like this is, th this is a famous game, right? And, and, and you, you just, you, you, you have to have something as an improvement. And Hans made it look so easy. I mean, he put his queen nice and center and then he just launched his pawns. And then when he, when he clarified the center, he just locked the center. And look how beautifully, I mean, one rook, then the knight routes to f5, the rook goes to g8, the rook goes to b8, h4, anchoring in the knight on the g3 square. Just spectacular stuff. I mean, making it look effortless against really good players. You thought that game was good? Yeah, what I'm about to show you might even be nicer. He played against Max Varmerdam, who's a strong Dutch grandmaster. Uh, and Max went for a King's Indian defense. The King's Indian defense has gone really out of fashion at the highest level of chess. It used to have like a massive, massive, massive score for black, and it was played by Kasparov and Rajabov and Dingley Ren, in fact. 
uh, world champion contender in 2023. But nobody really plays it anymore uh, at like 2650 plus level. Uh, and the reason, okay, that's like a strong statement, but very few people play it. Uh, because white gets a comfortable advantage in many lines, and Hans plays h3, bishop e3, which is actually something that I myself have played. And the point is that white just gets this, and just wants to play g4. And put the knight on g3, and just start an attack, just start an attack. Just put the knight on g3, put the pawn on g4, h4, h5, etc. Uh, Max tries to fight back in the center with c6. Hans plays knight f3. Black plays knight a6, and knight e8. So, trying to play the move f5, and also rotate the knight this way. Now, Hans here takes on c6, and plays this very, very nice idea c5. He's able to play this because he would not have been able to play this, let's say, like, here. I mean, he could try, but none of this works because that's defended by the rook. But when you play knight e8, white has this moment here to do this and then play c5. And he's able to do this because of this pin and the rook is no longer defending the queen. So for this moment and this moment only, he is able to play this move. Now probably here Max needed to do something like this and then slowly recapture this pawn. Instead of that, Max tries to fight fire with fire with the move f5. He spends 20 minutes on the move f5 and Hans plays pawn takes d6, which was his idea. Knight takes d6. Gives a check and puts his, puts his rook on the center line. Hans is better here. He's better because black is really stuck. Black has this little peace cube, but he's really stuck. And he's really struggling to make forward progress. Now the queen goes to e7. Hans attacks the knight. You'll notice that black's queen side is kind of in ruins. Kind of in ruins. Black really prefers a, a close center with some attacking chances. Queen b7 defends. Castles. F4. And the bishop draws back to d2, and again, white is better. Why is white better? Better pieces, all right? Better pieces. And black's piece is kind of stuck, and the structure is kind of frozen. Rook e8 played, queen c4, pins the knight on f7, and Hans begins kind of mobilizing on the queen side, and here it goes from bad to worse. As Max plays bishop e6 attacking the queen, Hans drops back, Offering up the pawn on a2, and both players go down a rabbit hole. Bishop takes a2 is what Max plays, and they both calculate the same line, but one calculates better. You see, bishop takes a2 has a very clear plan of bishop b3 or just in general coming out. Now, obviously, both players calculate the move knight c5 here which attacks the queen and threatens to play the move b3, trapping in the bishop. However, there's queen b6. And you cannot just rush with the move b3, because I will remove the defender of that pawn. So knight c5, queen b6, rook a1 attacking the bishop, and max plays knight e6. Hits the knight, you can't take, because I'll take this, you can't take, because I'll escape. So Hans plays b4, and the bishop is trapped. It cannot escape. Knight takes c5, bc5 hits the queen, and the bishop is still hanging. Someone's got to account for it. Bishop to b3, hits the queen back. Queen can't be taken. So queen c3, the queen is hanging. The only way the queen can defend the bishop is by staying on the b-file. And rook to b1, rook to b8, bishop c4. And that's it. Black resigned. Now you might think it's not the end of the world to lose a bishop. At this level it is. Why? Because after I take the bishop, I will have lifelong pressure on that. And, I mean, I can just even very simply do this. And uh, at this level of chess, having a full extra knight is more than enough. To win a game. Uh, Hans plays a, into a King's Indian at the exact right moment. Busts the center. Very nice idea. C5 utilizing that weakened queen. His opponent locks the center with f4, but that's not good enough. White has too much peace activity and he gets and black gets caught with his hand in the cookie jar. A beautiful four sequence of moves traps the bishop 
and bishop c4. And this was one of uh, several wins. I think Hans beat four strong grandmasters uh, in Menorca, and he tied for first place. He didn't win first place because of, like, tie breaks and whatever. Uh, but Hans Niemann's back. Hans Niemann is back, and he's looking sharp, and he's playing well. Uh, and uh, I don't know what his next tournament is, but in this one, he got seven points out of nine, 2705 performance rating with a rating of 2706. So looking sharp and uh, looking forward to his next event. He, he can't say too much, but he does his talking on the chessboard because as we all know, chess speaks for itself. And uh, in several of these games, it really did. And Hans only lost one game in this event. Uh, and it was to uh, V Pranav, who's a very quickly rising uh, young Indian player. So I look forward to seeing his next tournament. And if you don't know the Hans and Magnus thing, you got to go down that rabbit hole. So check that out and uh, do me a favor and get out of here.